This is the Schuylkill River. It's more than 100 miles long, and it runs right through the heart of the great city of Philadelphia. Uh, the Delaware River to its east is the one that I think most people tend to think of when they think about Philly. The Delaware is larger, and it happens to be the border between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. But the Schuylkill River is inextricably tied to the identity of Philly, in part because the surest way to tell a Philly local from an outsider is if they can look at the name of this river, which looks like it should be pronounced Shoil kill or maybe squeak kill? And if you can say it right, if you can look at that and say, oh yeah, the Schuylkill, boom, you're from Philly. Easy. Well, right now, dangling perilously over the Schuylkill River in the middle of Philadelphia is a crude oil tanker. This is one of several tankers that brings tens of thousands of barrels of crude from oil-rich North Dakota to a refinery in South Philadelphia every week. And early Monday morning this week, a train that had six cars loaded with highly volatile crude oil went off the tracks while crossing the river, leading to this rather terrifying sight of the train car full of oil dangling over the river. Thus far, no oil has been spilled and nobody has been hurt, but this remains an ongoing situation in Philadelphia. And this, of course, is just the latest in a string of rail accidents involving crude oil. There was the derailment in Quebec in July that killed 47 people, nearly destroyed an entire town, spilled a million and a half gallons of crude. There was the oil tanker derailment in Alabama in November, a train carrying about three million gallons of crude oil. That fire burned for days. There was also the derailment and explosion that happened a few weeks ago outside Fargo, North Dakota. That derailment led to the release of about 400,000 and gallons of crude oil. And if it seems like these sorts of accidents are happening with more frequency, it's because these sorts of accidents are happening with way more frequency, way more. There's been a huge spike in oil rail car accidents over the past year, accidents involving rail cars that transport crude oil. According to really remarkable new data just released by the feds, more crude oil was spilled from rail cars in the last year than was spilled in the previous 37 years combined. If you add up all the oil spilled in rail car accidents starting in 1975, you take it up through 2012, that amount combined is less than the amount of oil that spilled just in the past year. The alarming frequency with which these sorts of accidents have been happening led the NTSB today to take the unprecedented step of joining with their counterpart agency in Canada to call for an overhaul in the way that crude oil is delivered by train. The two agencies issued a series of recommendations aimed at making crude oil rail shipments safer. And it's pretty clear that it needs to be made safer. Just ask the poor Schuylkill River with this looming, looming ahead right now. The alternative, of course, to transporting truly large bulk amounts of oil by train is to transport it instead through pipelines. And proponents of pipelines, specific, specifically, of course, the Keystone XL oil pipeline, they right now are using all these high profile recent oil train accidents to say, hey, look, pipelines are safer. Trains are blowing up everywhere. Give pipelines the green light. Go Keystone. Undercutting that argument is, of course, the mind-numbing number of pipeline spills that have also soiled big swaths of the country recently, like the pipeline explosion in Mayflower, Arkansas in March that made an entire neighborhood essentially uninhabitable, or the pipeline spill that fouled the once pristine Yellowstone River in Montana in 2011, or the pipeline spill underneath the Kalamazoo River in Michigan a year earlier. That cleanup has taken years, and it is still ongoing in Michigan sort of a pick your poison, right? I mean, do you want the exploding rail car behind door number one, or do you want the potentially exploding pipeline behind door number two? Well, in the great state of Texas right now, what they are getting is an extra dose of door number two. Yesterday, the oil company TransCanada started shipping crude oil through the southern leg of the Keystone oil pipeline. The proposed stretch of the Keystone Pipeline that's awaiting approval from President Obama is the northern leg, which would stretch from Nebraska into Canada. But yesterday, it was the southern leg of that pipeline that opened for business. That pipeline carries crude oil from Cushing, Oklahoma, through the state of Texas, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And a number of Texas landowners have been fighting that pipeline for months. As of yesterday, it's up and running. In response to it being up and running, those landowners announced yesterday that they have launched a new group called... Texas Pipeline Watch to ensure that any leaks along that pipeline are detected as soon as possible. 
This is some video that the group sent to us today of their initial inspections along the newly pumping pipeline. They tell us they are checking temperature gauges along the pipeline as well as visiting local pump stations along the route. They're calling their Texas Pipeline Watch Texas's biggest neighborhood watch program. And you might not expect that kind of thing in an oil and gas state like Texas, right? But it turns out Texas Pipeline Watch isn't an anomalous thing. There are things going on in Texas and in Texas politics right now that might surprise you. This is the city of Azle, Texas. Azle is a city of about 10,000 people located in North Texas. It's just outside Fort Worth. Over the last few months, something has been happening in Azle that has never happened before. On November 5th at around 9.30 p.m. local time, the ground started to shake beneath Azle, Texas, a 2.6 magnitude earthquake. Now, earthquakes are not a common feature in that part of the country, so that 2.6 magnitude quake took everybody by surprise. Then the next day, it happened again. This time it was a 2.7 magnitude earthquake, which hit at around 11 o'clock in the morning. That same night, two more earthquakes. What? Something was going on in Azel that had never happened before. Did you feel it? Another earthquake rumbled through North Texas. Hello, everyone. I'm Gloria Campos. I'm John McKay. Some homeowners are reporting some minor damage after that quake struck. It was around 640 near Azel. It measured uh, 3.6. That's the 12th earthquake to hit North Texas this month alone. It is also the strongest in five years. The 12th earthquake in two and a half weeks? That was in November. Then it started getting worse. It seems like every single day now we are reporting on yet another earthquake at the Tarrant Parker County line. And now we know that where I am standing right now along Boyd Road, this is the epicenter of many of those earthquakes. Now, there have been 30 quakes since November 1st in this area. The two this week were magnitude 3.3. 30 earthquakes in the span of two months in an area that does not typically experience earthquakes at all. What's going on? Well, most of the earthquakes that have struck that area around Azle, Texas, since November 1st, have been clustered around a pair of injection well sites for fracking. Residents of the city of Azle have pointed to those injection wells as what they believe to be the cause of the earthquakes, or at least a possible cause of the quakes. Earlier this month, about 800 residents of Azel packed into a town hall meeting where they called on state officials to give them some answers about what's happening in their city. Feels like a semi-truck hitting your house with a bomb going off. Shut down an injection well and see if the earthquake stops. We are not going to have any clean water. Since we are on such a tight time frame, we're trying to keep it to comments only. Um, so it, it, and we want to hear, no, we're here, we're, we're here to listen. After only an hour, residents began leaving the meeting. Most grumbling the same frustration as Kevin Wilson. I, I truly believe this was the dog and pony show. The Texas state officials who came to that meeting uh, did refuse to answer any of the questions from the residents. They said they were just there to listen. They sat there while the residents talked, but they didn't talk themselves. After that meeting was over, a group of Azel residents decided that instead of the state coming to them and refusing to answer their questions, they were going to go to the state. And so this week, a group of residents of Azel, Texas, loaded themselves onto a bus and traveled 200 miles to the state capitol in Austin to go plead with the state's railroad commission, which oversees drilling in that state, to help them figure out what is causing these earthquakes in their town. How would you like to have it where you can't have your grandkids come over to play in their yard? Because if they fall in a sinkhole, they'll break their leg. While you're doing your studies, I would like to ask you to shut these wells down. What do you think is behind the large amount of earthquakes in a short period of time? That, that's what we're going to try to find out. After hearing the residents' concerns for more than three hours, quote, the three-member commission remained noncommittal about a response to the tremors. So what happens next? How does a tiny city like Azel take care of itself here when the very ground on which it is built is starting to betray them? And they are saying they need help from their state. And so far, they are not getting it. Joining us now for the interview is the mayor of Azel, Texas, Alan Brundrett. Mayor Brundrett, thank you very much for being with us. I really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you for having me. Let me just ask you first, um, knowing what the magnitude is isn't necessarily the best way to understand how bad these, these earthquakes are. H have you felt them yourself? How bad are they in town? 
They're fairly bad. It depends on what kind of structure you're in as to how much you feel it. But the first earthquake that I felt was actually during a city council meeting. Um, we had a meeting and that one, it just felt like somebody kicked the back of your chair. I know that um, we heard a resident there talk about sinkholes and worries about their own personal property, having the grandkids play in the in the yard. Have there has there been structural damage or visible damage caused by the quakes? There's been reports of people saying they have cracks in their bricks and things like that. But the hard part is being able to prove that it was caused by the earthquake, you know, for a fact. That's been the difficult part for it, especially with the settling ground that we have here in Texas. I know that you helped set up that meeting in Azel, uh, yes. where state officials came, people trying to get some answers to this new problem of earthquakes. It sounds like, at least from the local news reports that I watched, uh, that it didn't help matters, that people were more frustrated than anything else. Uh, what yeah. happened there? What were, you, what were you hoping for? How did you feel about that? We really didn't have much information for they said, I, I sent some letters to the Railroad Commission requesting a formal investigation into the earthquakes. And they actually responded fairly quickly. Within a week, they called me and scheduled the town hall meeting. So, I, you know, th logically thinking it was going to be kind of a question and answer type meeting, give some people some information, what they plan to do and things like that. But it was none of that. They had the meeting, they came out and just took comments. And it, it frankly frustrated people and it did more harm than good, in my opinion. Some folks in the energy industry argue that you know, it's maybe coincidence, that there's, there's no way to know for sure if fracking and techniques like these injection well sites and everything, if those are the things that are leading uh, to the earthquakes. Is there anything that you think could be done or should be done to prove the cause of the quakes? Well, I would say an, uh, a coincidence, first of all, would be if we had one earthquake, not that we have 30 earthquakes in a matter of months. Um, I mean, we definitely need to get the well shut down. Any common sense person that looks at the research dating back to 1960s can see that injection wells can cause earthquakes. So they need to be shut down, and that would be the easy thing, see if the earthquakes stop. And that'll tell you if it caused it or not. What is next for you and, and for your town and those frustrated residents who formed the Earthquake Express with that trip down to Austin? What, what's right. next for you to try to get this fixed? Well, I have some plans in place. Right now, I'm trying to get some data because, you know, they don't want to do anything without data, without some scientific proof. So, you know, the USGS, they've been doing some studies in Azel already. They have been for, you know, over a month now. So as soon as they get some data together, then we'll basically have some ammunition to go to get them shut down because the wells are outside of our city limits so we don't have any kind of authority to do anything but once we get some evidence and basically make enough noise i think we can get something done basically i i won't stop until it's done well the noise that you are making already uh has national resonance i can tell you that uh from here in new york uh mayor alan right. Brandred of azel um thank you for uh, being willing to explain this to us tonight i hope you'll stay in touch as you keep keep up this fight thank you definitely thanks all right thank you